You're listening to Make It, the indie film podcast. If people are dieting now more than ever before, then why are nearly one in three American adults overweight? Dr. Gundry, who's helped thousands lose weight and feel younger and healthier than ever, says most people are not getting enough fat-burning MCTs from their food. MCTs are a special kind of compound that instead of turning into fat when you consume it, turns into ketones, which is a chemical that breaks down the excess fat in your body. So, by getting more MCTs in your diet, you essentially flip a switch that puts your body in caloric bypass mode, which can flush out excess fat and calories. And he's created an easy way for you to activate caloric bypass right at home. It's called MCT Wellness. This powerful blend of fat-flushing MCT powders and antioxidant-rich polyphenols is designed to help you unlock your body's fat-burning, energy-producing potential. What's even better is that it's a delicious drink. I love how incredible it tastes. All you do is add a scoop to water, enjoy, and watch as you start feeling slimmer and more energized. So, if you want to experience a quick, easy, and effective way to melt pounds fast, go to countrymd.com energy and order right now to get up to 53% off your regular price order with a 90-day money-back guarantee. Again, that's G-U-N-D-R-Y-M-D dot com slash energy. Ready to level up your career? Text DISH to 44043 now to dive into a world of exciting technician opportunities at DISH. From cutting-edge technology to a supportive work environment, DISH offers the perfect platform for your success. Connect with us today to discover how you can be part of a dynamic team driving innovation. Connect today and join the DISH family, where innovation meets opportunity. Text DISH to 44043 to kickstart your journey towards a rewarding career. Well, I'll start, I'll start just a little bit of the advanced prep here. We know everybody's got busy lives, busy schedules. But uh, thank you all for joining us here today for advancing your career in filmmaking, festivals, pitches, and gatekeepers. We're excited to share some of the inside keys of how to really move the ball for, forward. Um, you know, breaking into Hollywood and, and staying in the game is not easy. And I'm fortunate to have these two all-stars with me today to help share these inside tips. Um, but, you know, if you, if you have a script, you have a project on the festival circuit, maybe you just finished the festival circuit, you're trying to find distribution or trying to take that next pitch into your follow-up project, we're going we're gonna to share some keys that I think will really help you today. Um, I'm going to introduce myself real quickly. I'm John Fitzgerald. Let these guys introduce themselves, and then we'll jump into how the show's going to run today. Hey, everybody. I'm Chris Barkley with the Make It Podcast, and I'm also a film producer. been part of three feature films that are all in worldwide distribution, a handful of short films. I'm a PGA producer, and I'm also a reader of The Blacklist, uh, vice president of the Nashville Film Festival, and I'm on the... Uh, financial advancement committee of NPR, so in WPLN. So, Nick, take it away, please. Oh, I will take it, my friend. Yeah, so all the stuff that Chris said at the beginning, you just, I just say ditto, right? So co-host of the Make It Podcast, film producer, three feature films. I've uh, been doing the podcast thing for a couple of years now and just want you folks to know why we do it. Uh, we do it for the same reason that John is doing what he's doing here today for you folks, is that we want to make sure that we're providing insight, information, advice, and even perspectives from other people in the film industry to the filmmaking audience. So whatever we can do to bring knowledge and insights you know, to you folks, that's what we're going to do. And we really appreciate John for inviting us to do that again here today. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it's, it's an honor to have you join me here today. And uh, so, yeah, so I'm John Fitzgerald, and I've had the pleasure of being in the film festival space for many years, as some of you may know. Uh, I was a co-founder of Slam Dance and ha had the opportunity to run AFI in Santa Barbara. I've done a lot of festivals. Uh, I've also made a half a dozen documentaries and, and wrote a book called Filmmaking for Change. Um, 
and and along with these guys, I, I've spent a lot of time just really investing into supporting filmmakers. It's really what I do. And a couple of years ago, I started doing some courses with a partner, Justin Giddings. We did Film Festival Mastery. I do one on Distribution Revolution. And uh, yeah, we're just here today to, to to share some some keys to help help you jumpstart your career or, or get to the next stage. So I'm going to tell you really quickly kind of how this is going to run today. Uh, so everybody understands, and yes, we are recording, and yes, we will send replays if you have to jump. But essentially, we're gonna we're gonna talk through these three keys, and we'll, I'm gonna rifle through really quickly. I know your time is precious. We're gonna get through it really quick, five to ten minutes on each key, and then these guys are gonna jump in, and share some more words of wisdom, and then after we get through the three keys. We're going to open up to Q&A, so you just you know, throw a question in that chat, and we'll, we'll do as much as we can. We definitely want to try and keep this to the hour, get you back to your, your, your day. But um, the other thing you should know is there's going to be information in the right margin there where you can actually figure out how to find us. You can reach out to us. You can see some of our products. These guys have an amazing store, so visit their site. They'll put links in for their podcast. So we'll let you know how to find us kind of at the end, and again, we'll, we'll follow up with uh, everything else. But uh, I think we're good to go. Any final thoughts, guys, before I, before I jump in here? I'll start to uh, share my screen. Based on how many slides we have prepared today, I think we should just jump right in. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so let's jump in. Let's go. Hop in. <laughs> All right, I'm going to share my screen. screen mode. How are we doing, guys? Can you see everything okay? Yep, I can see it. Let's see if everybody in the audience can see it, too. Just give us a thumbs up or just say say yes if you can see it, and we'll take it from there. Cool. All right, let's jump in. So here are the three things we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about festivals, pitches, and gatekeepers. First up will be festivals. We're going to talk about strategy, networking, how to follow up. Pitches, we're going to talk about goals, your script, and your package. Then we're going to get into reps, exhibitors, and partners under gatekeepers. Uh, the first thing here, again, is festivals. So when you have film festivals, you, you know, some of you have a film that's ready to go. Some of you may be just researching which festivals could be appropriate. But the truth is there, there are specific categories in the film festival arena, Right. So it's important to know which festivals are industry festivals, which festivals are destination festivals, community festivals. Most of you are going to want to put those laurels on your poster. You're going to want to talk about them in your follow-up materials. So you've got to make sure they're credible. So you've got to do the research. And then hospitality. If you want to network, you need to go to festivals that have strong hospitality programs, right? And getting on the radar. It's amazing to me how many clients have told me, they can check their Vimeo stats, and their films aren't even being seen by festivals. They're not always being open. I'm going to skip those for now and just jump right into festivals. So you're, you're All right, John, let's just make sure we're flipping through the slides. I think for me, I see the, uh, the first yeah, slide too. still. You don't see the festival strategy slide? We see advance nope, your career in filmmaking one. slide, which I mm. think is the opening slide. Opening slide. Okay. And this could be this Man. could be because you may not be in present mode. Are you seeing me now? Your screen is no longer sharing, but um, but I'm sure that's going to change here in a second. We see you. We see yeah, you yeah. just we, fine. But the uh, <laughs> okay. All right. Well, if you see me, yeah. then. I feel like I need to share my screen again. We'll try this yeah, one yeah. more time. Worst case scenario, I'll talk people through it, and then I'll share yeah, it. All good. We're here, we're here for you, John. We're, we're here for the filmmaking community and for you. We're, we're, we have nowhere to be but right here. This is, this is the best place in the world to be. All right. You seeing my screen yeah. now? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There it is, yep. festival strategy. Okay, cool. And if I click again, are you seeing that one? We see TIFF, yep. 
Okay, sweet. All right, so maybe the screen sharing was on full screen and it didn't like that. So we'll just use this okay. one. Go with it. All right, so your strategy is driven by your goals, which means are you trying to sell your film? Are you trying to just get laurels for your film? Are you trying to network? Are you trying to meet other filmmakers? There's a lot of reasons why people play film festivals. It's important to understand what your strategy is before you jump in. TIFF is one of the top-tier festivals, obviously, in Toronto. This is a festival that has become essentially a market. It's also a place where people launch prestige pictures in the fall if you're in the studio game. But you can meet a ton of people there. It's a great festival. But you have other festivals that aren't top tier, like Newport Beach, but it's still a great film festival. You meet tons of filmmakers. They have great panels. So it's a top regional festival, if you will. Dances with film, same thing. Great industry festival with some regional mixed in, and it's not quite as popular as Toronto or Sundance, but you're going to meet a lot of people, and you're in Hollywood's backyard. So you got to do your research. If you're interested in networking, hospitality is important to you, right? So you got to find out which festivals have strong hospitality programs. You want to go to the parties, go to the mixers. And then the last thing is stay on the radar. You need to make sure that these festivals know you exist. Find an excuse to follow up with them. They're getting thousands of submissions. So you need to know which – you need to be able to reach out to them and say – I shot my film in your area, or my lead actor lives there, or we just got a distribution offer. Whatever that excuse is, follow up, help you bubble up to the top. Sometimes just sending a trailer link can really help you. Networking is really important. We talked about that. You're going to have an opportunity to connect with other talent at festivals, writers, producers. You're a writer. You might meet a director. You might meet an actor. So it's important to just get out there and connect. Industry reps, who's there? Who's on the jury? Do they have panel discussions? Find out who's there. And if they're not there, you can still reach out to some of the companies you want to be aware of your project and just let them know that you're in this festival and send them a link. Connect with the festival team. It's amazing how many alumni return to festivals and, and they come back time and time again. And festival programmers talk, so keep Keep up with them, thank them, be grateful, and they'll tell other programmers about your film. One of the things that, that I think people really lag in is the follow-up. You meet people at festivals, you meet them at a party, you're, you're, you're talking, you're talking about projects, but then you don't really follow up. It's really important to just follow up with the filmmakers that you met there, and they could be potential partners for future projects or remind them of something, or maybe they have something coming up that they didn't have when you just met them. So just follow up with them. Again, thank the festival team. Good thing to stay on their radar. They'll remind other programmers about you. And then follow up with industry contacts. It's amazing to me how many times you meet somebody that's in the industry Maybe it's an investor, maybe it's an executive, maybe it's just another producer, and then you get home and you get back to your life and you forget to follow up, and I think that that's a missed opportunity. So I'm going to stop sharing there, jump in and let these guys fire away some of their nuggets. Well, I thought that was all really good. I think the first thing is your goals. I think you nailed it with, like, what do you want to do with this film, and are you a good, you know, are are you being honest with yourself on, on what your film can do? Like how good is your film? What does it deserve? Right? So if you have a goal of, I don't know, selling your film for multiples of millions of dollars in a festival, uh, but it's not good enough to, to garner that, um, you should know that first. You, sh- you should be honest enough with yourself to say, Okay, this this one wasn't the one, and then maybe your goal will be to garner laurels. Laurels from film festivals that that don't have a name, they don't mean a lot uh, in terms of being able to sell, uh, but uh, what laurels would do on your cover art is get people to stop and consider watching it. So if you're going to collect a bunch of laurels, make sure that shows up on your cover art, make sure it's part of your marketing, part of your branding. And then when you get that services deal or you're able to shotgun that movie out to AVOD or SVOD and other places, people will stop and say, okay, this isn't like, you know, some, some crazy movie from, you know, Nigeria. 
this is <laughs> that's on Tubi. This movie has been awarded, and not to say that all movies out of Nigeria, but they're not. But but you guys know the Tubi movies I'm talking about. Uh, okay, that's this isn't that. Maybe I should give this a shot, and then that will you know be streaming dollars for you. So Nick, do you have anything you want to add to uh, to that? Yeah, I'm just going to first say, I love that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but I'll, I'll just take it back to the goals thing as well, because I think that's spot on. But I will offer this, that those goals need to be identified when you're making your film so that your festival process is part of meeting the goals for your film. Right. So it's a little bit less about a goal for the festival. It's about the goal for the film that then brought you to those festivals to do all the things that John was talking about. So make sure you have those goals set. And then back to what Chris was saying, just be honest with yourself. Right. Be realistic as possible. I know as creatives, we're all hopeful and we're all dreamers. Uh, but, you know, there is a business side to this as well. So make sure that you're grounding yourself in the realities of things. And if this film is just the film to get you noticed, to get a laurel, uh, to get some some work under your belt, to get some experience, that's OK, too. It doesn't have to be the thing that puts you on the map. It could be the thing that keeps you going. So just set those goals early on when you're making your film. That'll set you up really for success. When you and, John, can I circuit. talk about two other points you made um, really quickly? Sure. So, one, yeah. you talked about being sure to follow up with contacts at festivals. Uh, this is a pretty good idea, obviously, uh, on, on its face. But um, temper those requests um, with some of those folks. You know, like, don't ask for you know, everything in the world in an email um, so this is a concept that's called the yes ladder. And the yes ladder comes from psychology, uh, a, a study. I can't remember which university, John, but it does, basically it says if you ask someone a small favor first, they are much more likely to do a large favor for you later. And the yes ladder is a wonderful tool for filmmakers to use, um, Especially at festival. At festival, if an industry person is there, they really, really, really want to have a good time. And they're there kind of to get away from their day to day. So don't ask them to buy your movie when you go up and shake their hands. Ask them to for a beer or a cocktail. You want to have co- there's a great bar. They're offered to buy yeah. them. A can, beer. can I buy you a cocktail? Can I buy you a beer? And let it start with that small thing. And then maybe you can hit them with something a little bit bigger via email down the line or even later that night or whatever you want to do. But the, but that's how you do it. You use the yes ladder, very, very small, easy yeses in the beginning, and then try to get a big yes later. Of course, at some point, your work does have to show up and, and, and be great. And then the other thing, and I think, Nick, you actually touched on this as well, which is film success versus festival success. There is a such thing as working a festival success, successfully uh, completely aside from the goal you might have for your film. Uh, if you go to enough festivals across the nation and across the world, you will run into the same people over and over and over again. And that becomes a community. That's the world yeah. It becomes, you become a family and it becomes a thing. And now you have this group, this network that you have that are just, um, they're rooting for you. They're helping you. Every content that they make is a contact you just made. So if you want to go to a festival and you're going to go to a lot of them, that networking piece that John talked about is key in, in knowing that you're going to see these faces again and again. Yeah, so I just want to just do one clarifying thing and just say thank you to John for clarifying Chris's statement earlier about asking for the beer, because I was just thinking that I would go up to somebody at a bar and be like, hey, can I have your beer? Right, right. <laughs> that might, might not, not work out so might well, not be right? as great. So. <laughs> Some people can get right, away with right, it. Right, Some people right. have gotten away with it. <laughs> right. Some people right, don't want to beer. John. What you got for Some us? people want to <laughs> right. um, All right. That's so right. let's just let's just move into pitches here. It's, it's something that uh, you just mentioned, the idea of like the, the ladder. Yeah, yes, ladder. You, you don't want to ask for the moon. But but the important thing is when you're when you're reaching out to people to advance your career, you got to have you got to have your materials put together properly, right? I've, it's amazing to me how many people just try and get somebody on the phone and they're not ready to actually have that conversation. You got to have everything set. 
So we're going to rifle through the goals and, and the script, whatever it is you're developing. It's a feature script. It's a, it's a, it's a new show. Whatever it is, you've got to have your materials down. We'll talk about the package. So, again, are you trying to sell your script? Are you trying to sell your movie? Or is it more important for you to raise money for your, your project? It's important to have that distinction. Or is your primary goal to just find representation? I can't tell you how many people I talk to say, I need to find an agent. I need to find a manager. We're going to cover that in, in the final key and, and tell you why that may or may not be really critical for you at this stage to advance mm-hmm. your career. But it's important to know if that's primarily your goal. Uh, and when you're developing your script, you got to think about, again, to, to Nick's point, what, what were your goals of this project? Was your goal initially to develop this so that you can get it into theaters? Or were you developing, are you developing pitches to be on streaming platforms? It's a very different game. And the, the honest truth is it's really hard to get a Netflix show or a Hulu show or, or get a show financed for one of the major platforms these days. It's much easier to develop an independent feature, but there are festivals now that will show series. Is the script ready? This is the single biggest problem with most movies today. The script isn't ready before they go into production. One of our partners, Writers Boot Camp, they have great packages. You should visit them. If not, find another find another service or friend to give you comments, give you coverage Really important that your script is ready. And then finally, let's talk about the package. Nuts and bolts, right? If you're going to try and go out and raise money to shoot a movie, chances are you're going to have to know how much you're trying to raise, right? You can't do a budget until you do a schedule. Can you shoot it in three weeks? Is it four weeks? Is it five weeks? So you got to get, get, get prepared. Do the schedule. Do the budget. And have your pitch down. You're going to be having cocktails, having that beer. you got to be ready to talk about the project. And, and one of the things that we always talk to filmmakers about when you're on the festival circuit, you've got a lot of momentum. People are loving your project. A lot of times it's just short. What's next for you? Is it a feature? Is it a series? Is it another short? Be ready to talk about that next project. And the elevator pitch. You guys know why it's called an elevator pitch, right? you got to be able to get the pitch out. By the time you get to the bottom floor when the elevator opens. Pitch decks. Really important these days. 20 years ago, there was no such thing. Now everybody needs a pitch deck. And I'm just showing you two slides today because they're the ones that aren't quite as obvious. You're always going to need a synopsis, some stills, who's your talent, what's the the, the lay of the land and the space and the genre that you're going to be filming in. But... Two slides that are critical, especially if you're trying to raise money, you got to know what the offering is going to be. Are you trying to raise $500,000? Are you trying to raise a million dollars? What What is it that you're offering these people? And then what's the return on investment, the ROI? People are going to want to know that. If I give you $25,000, when do I get my money back? So figure out what that waterfall is going to look like and be ready to have those conversations. All right. Gatekeepers, we're going to hold off on for now. I'm going to stop sharing screen and let you guys go to town. Yeah, I mean, I, thoughts on pitches. I, yeah, I think I have a, a few thoughts on this actually. So, your script being ready is it goes without saying. You, if it's not ready, you know, you, you, you're not going to do well. The question is, how do you know? That's what people need to know. How do you know when it's not ready? Especially when you've been living inside of a script for a long time. Uh, you can hallucinate. You can. You can have, you know, you can have hallucinations. I uh, can't tell you how many times uh, I've seen that. And it's because you live with it. This is your life. You're spending every day on the story. You're inside of it. You stop seeing things that other people see so clearly. Uh, it's like listening to a song where the singer is flat. And if you if you sit there and listen to that long enough or or play a piano that's out of tune, your brain will make it in tune over time. It will stop. It will cease to sound flat over time. Uh, So that's what happens with us as we write. It's good to have a brain trust and it's good to uh, be able to have tools to evaluate. So what I like is just making sure pre pro is long enough. Uh, I think the thing we want to do as independent filmmakers is 
come through on our promises. We're really, really dedicated to that, right? So we say, we're going to shoot August 1st. No matter what, we are shooting August 1st. Well, what if you didn't have time to do the pre-pro correctly? What if you didn't break down every scene to make sure you could actually shoot it? Um, no, table yeah, did reads. You, did you have time to do the table reads? Did you have time to um, make sure this stuff was feasible, uh, have the right cast. But what happens is we barrel forward anyway. We say, okay, no matter what the shortcomings were in pre-pro, we're going to shoot the movie anyway. That's always a recipe for disaster. Um, and we haven't even talked about making sure your contracts are in place, uh, the business side is done correctly. right? You should be in the black before you start shooting, ideally. Um, so I think script-ready, yes, how to do it, I think that's how you do it. You have to do a scene breakdown. You have to have a, a group of people with you that stay objective. Uh, have at least one person that's not part of the film that you trust, taste-wise, to go over it. And they're going to tell you some hard truths that you're going to hate. Take the, take the note, though, because that's going to be what the audience is. Um, I think on pitch, um, there's a variety of pitches. I, I kind of want to separate pitch from elevator pitch. Uh, elevator pitch is almost something that you get you luck into if it works. You got lucky. You caught somebody. You got a minute. Give them your pitch. The real pitch is in a room with producers, and it's longer. It's detailed. You have to have a pitch deck. You have to have um, some supporting media in there. And the whole thing with that is being honest about what would really sell you. If you were in my shoes, would you put money into this? Would you want to produce this? Is this really, truly exciting, or is it really exciting for you? <laughs> and and uh, on the elevator pitch side, I think this is effective on the regular pitch side as well, the sort of normal pitch, is it's all about the hook. That's really important. And, by the way, a hook of a pitch isn't just what's selling it, but it's about the audience, and so instead of saying, here's a story about a guy who meets a girl that goes up a hill, you know, get, give us a hook about uh, why we would want to see this guy and girl go up the hill. That's far more effective. Because immediately, like, we have to think about, and for, at least in my shoes as a producer and Nick's shoes as a producer, we have to think about how we're going to sell this. How are we going to make this financially viable so that you can make your next thing? So, Nick, you got anything? Uh, cool. All right, I'll pick it up from there. Yeah, so I got two things, right? So the first thing is back to what John was saying about an elevator pitch. Okay, I want everyone to understand that there's a difference between an elevator pitch and a bathroom pitch. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and the difference is don't do the bathroom pitch. <laughs> the reason why you have an elevator pitch is you have the captive audience in an environment where it makes sense mm -hmm. to pitch. Right. Don't pitch somebody in the bathroom. They're a captive as well, but it's mm -hmm. not appropriate to do it. Right. So you have to make sure that you're gauging the appropriateness of the pitch as well and looking at things. I would love to know the story behind because that. Because I think back to one of the things. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I won't go there, right? Uh, but one of the things that Chris was talking about was the idea that, you know, any investment that's made in a film or a script or anything is really not an investment in those things. It's an investment in you. That's the first step. So if you mess up the context in which you pitch, then you've already kind of burned that bridge. So make sure you're doing that in the appropriate context. And then back to when you pitch, for any pitch, we always say that you got to think about your whys. And the first one, when you think about it, is like, why you, right? As an individual, why should I listen to you, right? What is it that you're bringing to the table in, the, in this discussion? Who you are as a human being, because that's the first thing that I connect with. The next one is, yeah, why this story? Right. Why does this story need to be told? And you got to be specific. Don't say that, you know, this is what the world needs right now and everybody's going to love it. That's not specific enough. Right. That's not going to work. And then the next thing is, you know, like, why now? So why this story? Why now? And then I'll just say the last thing is why me? Right. If you're pitching me, why are all the first whys appropriate for me as the person being pitched? Why do you and I have a connection? Right. Why should this story connect to me? What is it about this, what's happening in the world right now that actually works with my platform? Right. All of those things need to align. So, again, it's why you, 
why this story, why now, and why me as the person. Yeah, it's beautifully put. I just want to expound upon that last one, the why me. You know, we have this thing called the extra dollar, me and Nick. And the extra dollar theory is this this idea that if it's just about money, then anyone that comes in with one more dollar than we have is your new best friend. And that's a really terrible way to build a film team. Hey, everybody. Chris here to talk about Indie Insights. It's our bi-weekly newsletter. And love note to the film industry, movies, and the creatives who make them, not to mention you, our esteemed listeners. Inside, you'll find curated industry trends, articles, exclusive commentary, and underappreciated films from filmmakers like yourself worldwide. The best part is that it is completely free. So sign up today at www.bonsai.film forward slash subscribe. It just takes a few seconds. And once you sign up, you'll get our next newsletter on Friday morning. It's that simple. Just go to www dot bonsai dot film forward slash subscribe to get indie insights our bi-weekly newsletter and join a network of film creatives just like yourself and now back to the show yeah that's good good stuff i might have to borrow yep. that. all right pitch in the back <laughs> <laughs> i might have to borrow that all right so we're gonna go back and finish up with our third key here where we talk about the gatekeepers. And let me just say, if it's not already obvious, you know, sometimes you don't need gatekeepers. If you have a great idea, a great script, a good team, and a good package of materials and a good pitch, you can probably raise some funds and get this thing made. But I think a lot of people are really, really dialed into, you know, how do I, how do I get representatives? You know, how I deal with distributors and exhibitors and, and what do I need to do to get to these people? And so we're going to go through this now. So, again, the representatives, it's important to understand the d- d- distinction. A lot of people don't know this, but agents and managers are two very different entities in the business. And, of course, there's different layers of agents and different layers of managers. The big agencies, the big three, right? you got CAA, you got William Morris Endeavor, and you got UTA, and then you got an- another tier – and then there's and then there's smaller tiers after that. Agents are there to get you deals, to submit projects, to do contracts, get deals done. Managers pay a bit more attention to your careers. So it's important to understand the difference that managers are not supposed to be writing contracts. It's an important distinction. And producers reps, if you have a finished film, producers reps really come in handy because they're the ones that can get it in front of distributors, especially if you're an independent filmmaker. They're the ones that are going to put it in front of the A24s and the Neons and, you know, Gravitas, Fox Searchlight, all the different levels that you can get to in the, in the representative side. All right, so let's talk a little bit about exhibitors. Again, it depends on what you're trying to do. Back to goals, right? Are you trying to get your movie onto the big screen? Are you trying to get your finished film into theaters? Or are you trying to sell your screenplay? What is your goal with the gatekeepers and if you're trying to set up your project? Is it going to be finding a streaming platform? Are you trying to go straight to video? There's a lot of money in the streaming market now, right? The game has changed. But some people still feel like they need to be in theaters. And the, the important thing to understand is that not, not everybody can get their project in front of Netflix. Without an agent, it's hard to do that. So how do I get to an agent? Well, you can go to the agencies with your materials, with your finished film, with your script. But some of the bigger agencies won't look at unsolicited material. So you have to go through the coordinators. You have to go through the assistants. Or you have to go through... Casting directors, but you can meet a lot of these people on the festival circuit as well. And the same thing, by the way, with distributors. You can't just reach out to somebody at Disney. They can't look at unsolicited material, but you can find people to get to these people through. Theaters. If you're a, a if you're a top tier studio distributor, you're 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 shipping to, to theaters directly, right? That's the game. But there's Tons of independent theater chains. You can go straight to the theater chains yourself if you want to play in those theaters. 
production partners. It's important to know if you're trying to set up a project, trying to sell a script, trying to sell a pitch, you got to know which of those venues will actually look at unsolicited material. Some of the studios I just said won't look at it, but there are producers that have deals with studios. You can usually get to those producers, and if you don't know the producer, you can use IMDb Pro and find out who the executives are. Those junior-level executives and assistants, it's their job to find good content, good talent, good acquisitions, good screenplays, good stories. So don't don't think just because you don't know how to get to Bruckheimer that you can't get to his company. You just have to go through the assistants. Sometimes it's worth it to just go to financiers directly. And some of these companies have, like some of the managers, in fact, have production divisions. So you can get to some of these second and third tier companies that have their own funding. If they're not companies that have their own funding, then you have to go to outside investors. All right, so those are the, those are the three keys. We talked about festivals, pitches, and gatekeepers. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and throw it back to you guys for some, some ideas around representation. I'm curious just to hear, because you guys have been in this a while, how important do you guys feel it is to have representation at, at the top-level agencies or management companies to advance your career? I think it's really important. I think it's really important. I mean, like it's not necessary at the beginning, and you might not even get it at the beginning of your career. Um, it's not necessary if you need to, or if you're, or if you're hoping to be an independent filmmaker. Maybe you're doing guerrilla style filmmaking, documentary making. I don't think it's going to be, you know, 100 percent essential. But the way that the industry works is they talk through intermediaries. So it's very difficult for you to get a meeting where you have the, the gatekeeper really is your agent, right? That's the gate. The gatekeeper is that agent that's that makes the other party realize that it, this is legitimate because mm -hmm. you can't imagine the number of solicitations and requests that uh, studios get and that executives get and how little time they have to sort of spread that around to, to every person that has a request. So a way to funnel or filter out the people who are less serious with the people who are more serious is through, or the people that are more ready, I should say, or less ready, is through agents and managers and through representation. Um, and an agent's job is to basically gatekeep your talent. Same with the manager. Both of those people, those job titles, they have to truly, truly believe in your talent. If they don't, you've got to fire them. But they have to believe in you. They have to see something in you. And that's why it's hard to get representation. But just to, just to clarify something, no, sorry please. to interrupt, but I want to just be clear on the, on the, kind of, on the independent mm -hmm. side, right? Because let's face it, most of the top three talent managers and agents aren't necessarily signing somebody right out of Sundance unless they won the top prize or mm -hmm. you know they're the next Tarantino or whatever. It's hard to get to the top level agencies and management companies. But for the filmmakers that are on the festival mm -hmm. circuit, <clears throat> excuse me, and there's roughly 15,000 of them, those folks don't necessarily need to get to the top tier. They're not trying to cast A-list talent for their no, next No, no, and 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 and, I'm just and, to and I wouldn't to help those yeah. guys out, like getting to the the, the next one hundred percent. And and I wouldn't say you need a top tier agent or manager in that regard. You need somebody that's hungry and wants to succeed as well. You know, the thing about an agent or a manager is they don't get paid until you get paid. So they have to be right. motivated. Uh, you know when. When we talk about the branding and marketing side, you know, in post, you know, you have two choices. You can go with a experienced sales house that's going to cost you an arm and a leg, or you can go with a young sales team that just started that wants to make a name for themselves. And you find this dichotomy across industries. You know, young, hungry lawyer, if you get a lawyer, or do you want a lawyer that's established and has a network, costs you a lot of money. And so the same thing is true of agents and managers. Uh, you know, you find them where you're at and then hope that you guys can come up together and, and do great things yeah. together. Now, you can, if you have the money, and you're independent, get a publicist. 
uh, that'll raise your profile and help you get an agent or manager down the line. But that's going to cost about six thousand to ten thousand dollars a month. Um, so it is pretty expensive if you want them to do a great job, like get you TV postings and podcast bookings and things like that. Um, maybe they'll cut you a deal. And it helps you if you have mm-hmm. a project to talk about, yep. right? You got if you have a film on the circuit, you want to hire a publicist to help drive some awareness. Yeah. Don't just have an idea and go spend five grand on a publicist. They're not going to have any. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Because it'll raise your profile. And and, and there's a company that we're affiliated with called Brandmark Digital. You guys can look them up online, brandmarkdigital.com. And uh, I believe it's the URL, Nick. And there's publicists there. And they they have a discounted rate for filmmakers, um, you know, thanks to our affiliation. So, you know, that to me, that's a really interesting way to get your name out there while you're building up your repertoire for an agent uh, or a manager. Was that the was that was that the question you asked, John? Because <laughs> I can I can talk yeah, about some I, other areas of gatekeeping too, if you'd like. Well, no, I think it's important, and I, I want to hear from Nick, but I think it's important to to have the yeah. distinction because there's no doubt that you can really use and in fact need yeah. an agent to get some of the A list projects through the studio system, but. But I think that there's there's a lot of filmmakers that I've talked to that that say I just played the festival circuit and I've got a script ready to go and now I need to find an agent. Oh uh, yeah. And I just I, I don't want people to feel like if they can't find an agent that they're dead no. in the water. Yeah. There's there's first of all to your point there's ways to to go to the agents at the level that you're mm-hmm. at right that are trying to grow and grow with them. It's a completely different they're process, looking, John. Looking for talent. What you're describing, John, is a completely different process, right? If you've already, or if you already have a show or a movie at a festival, you already did the thing the agent was there for in the first place. <laughs> so now you've already passed that. You you don't need to go get an agent. You need to find a distributor. You need to find a branding and marketing team. You need to find uh, someone who can, you know, maybe uh, a sales team that can pitch your film that's now should be, you know, up for sale and up for distribution, up for licensing. Right, but what if you, for example, let's say you did a short film and it did the festival circuit, and now you're ready to, to kind of move to the next level. You've got a feature script. Some oh, you just have a script. Unfortunately, yeah, or they feel they feel trapped, like they can't get to that next thing. They can't get this made because they can't get to anybody at CAA or William Morris or what. Like they just they feel stuck. And so part of what I want these folks to leave with today mm-hmm. is understanding if you do your homework. And you're working hard and you're understanding the lay, the lay of the land. Take your project, get it ready, get your package ready, get your pitch ready, get everything going, and then figure out the best path to get that project either made or sold. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be CAA and Right. Disney. Now I'm with you. I now see exactly what you're saying. So you have mm-hmm. a script. You did a short film. You have a script. Maybe the script won uh, a screenplay writing contest at, at a festival. Maybe mm-hmm. it got added to the blacklist. And so you know it's really good, and you want it to get you want it to get made. Now, I'm totally with you there. Um, yeah, I, you know I, I think what I would say to that is this, um, and this is another thing that me and Nick always say: uh, people want to attach themselves to a moving train, and when the best thing you can do for yourself is to be always working on your dream. So that people see you're all the way in. It's the same thing in any type of investment. If you um, uh, if you want money from somebody and they see that your focus is 50% on some other job you're doing or something else you're doing, it's going to be hard for them to give you money because they, they don't see that you're always working to get their money back. Does that make sense? So, so the best yeah, thing you can do is like be all in on your script, like always be working on it. All every conversation you have is about developing this incredible script, and people will start to believe in you. You will begin to inspire people through your dream, which is such a magical thing. It's an amazing feeling when it happens because people start to believe in you, and they don't even know what to speak to you about if it's not that thing because it's all you care about. That's called being two feet in. That's called being a moving train, and everyone is attracted to it. Nick, I'm sorry you were you've been waiting a while. Yeah, no, it's all good. It's all good. Now I was thinking, uh, you know, when John was talking about representation, 
in my mind, I'm kind of going through it. I'm like, there's so many different types of representation. So um, I want to talk about a couple of those, but I first want to get back to what John was saying about people feeling stuck and thinking, I have to have this thing in order to move forward. And I think the first thing is that the only person who really tells you that you can't do a thing is you. Right. That's it. I think that's what John is saying. Like, don't get stuck in that space right, thinking yeah. that you can't do something. No, build this project out. Ask questions. Identify people who can support you. Go to these film festivals. Network. Collaborate. Like, there's all these opportunities literally waiting around the corner, but you can't see them around the corner if you don't walk around the corner. <laughs> right. So don't get stuck in place. Yeah. Uh, and then the second thing I was thinking about when you're talking about representation and Chris brought up a couple of these points, is that there's so many different types of representation that are actually very important. And one of them is the publicist, as Chris mentioned. But there's, like, what is representation about? It's really about a couple of things. One is someone else is in the room when you can't be in the room, or, or and or someone's in the room with you who has a different type of expertise that you don't have. Mm -hmm. So I think about, like, representation also comes from a casting director. Right? They have access to people and to networks to get people into your project that could then get it to that next level. Right? You don't have to film the thing, but if you get an attachment, right, you get someone who's willing to be attached, mm -hmm. that in itself can help you sell. Right? Getting a lawyer is representation. Right? Making sure that all your contracts are squared yeah. away, that you're doing everything by the book so that you don't get screwed later on in a deal. Manage, managers, agents, their representation as well. Um, even mentors. Again, mentors can be representation. They can be there for you to give you the advice that you need, and they can also be there, again, in a room that you're not in because you're doing what Chris said. right? You are telling the world that you want to do this thing and that you are this person, and that mentor, that friend, that colleague is going to take that into a room that you're not in. They're going to mention the thing that you're working on, and someone's going to hear about it that's going to be interested yep. in that project. Right. So there's all sorts of different types of representation that are important to have. But again, back to John's point, you don't get a lawyer, a manager, an agent, a publicist, a producer, a mentor by sitting on your butt and saying you can't yeah. do a thing. Yeah. And so I want to hook totally into casting. You've got to be active. And I, I, I want to just piggyback on your oh, yeah, trade thing. I use that all the time, the idea of you, when you're talking to investors or you're talking to potential partners – whether it's an affiliate or even a cast member, it's like if the if if you represent that the train has left the yeah. station, this is happening. They want to get on board, and 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 a lot of people just find, unfortunately, reasons to just pause. They're not quite there. They're not quite there. This thing isn't perfect yet. This thing isn't, and they and it just slows you down. And I think if you just gain some momentum because you're confident in your script or your movie, the train left the station. And, Let's John, go. all this stuff is easier said than done, right? Like, <clears throat> me, myself, I, I battle with these ups and downs my whole life. You know, I can be in a dark place and have to pull myself out of it, <clears throat> feel down, feel depressed, feel like it's never going to happen. And you have to pull yourself out of it. Like, you can it's, – it's, it's easy to pause, first of all. And it's easy to listen to the devil on your shoulder telling you you're not worthy and, you know, all the imposter syndrome stuff. And almost every artist, great or not, that I know, especially the great ones, have a degree of imposter syndrome that they're that they're dealing with. And so it's easy to pause. And so I know these are just words spilling out of our mouths, making it sound like, yeah, just keep going. But there are tools that you can use to keep going when you get in those spots, um, to to sort of give yourself the confidence, sometimes step away, maybe for a day, John, and then get back to what you were doing, mm -hmm. something completely unrelated, mm -hmm. get uh, what I call just small W's, get small wins in your life, and then get that All confidence right. back, you know, to keep going. And before I forget, I just wanted to hook on to something that Nick said about casting. When you have a script and you don't have representation, your very, very best friends should be the best casting agent or director you can find, I should say, um, because that is how movies get sold uh, on the front end during pre-pro is attached cast. And remember, this is all under the caveat that your script has one at festivals. Maybe it's been blacklisted. It's a great script. 
So now you have cast attached. Now you can pre-sell the movie, and yes, that still is a thing. And now you're now you're going right. You because once the cast is attached, you you'd be surprised how many other people just come to, just come just, yeah. just come to your just yeah yeah it starts a domino effect. effect. So anyway, <clears throat> just a quick thought on casting. Awesome. Well, let's do this, guys. Since we do, I can't see from my screen how many people are still with us, but I'm hoping that we've got some folks that have some questions. So maybe we should flip this over to Q&A and, and answer some questions for our, our listeners today. Can you guys see the chat? Mm-hmm. Yep, and I can see it. If anything pops up, I'll, I'll let you know what comes up. We had a couple of just comments in the chat so far already. Um, I think we've actually a- answered one of the questions that came up about pitching. So I think they had actually asked that question right before you went into the pitch side. Uh, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see what comes up um, in the chat. But again, a lot of good, good comments there, and I've been commenting back as. Okay, and do we want to just read these out, Nick? The the, the questions that have already come through that maybe we haven't answered. Yep, and Nil has. Um, I'll let everybody know to go ahead and put some stuff there. Uh, one of the questions that did come up was, at what stage in their career does a director or a producer need an agent or a manager? So that kind of gets back to what John was saying as well about, hey, you don't necessarily need it up front, but there is a stage in which that would be preferred. Yeah, and I don't think we yeah, nailed the stage. Just, I'll just throw a ahead, quick John. answer out, and then, and then Chris, can, Chris can kind of follow up because I think he's got some great ideas on this line as well. But I think I think the important distinction is, what, where you are in your career and what kind of project it mm-hmm. is, right? If you're trying to, if you just finish the festival run with, with a short or an independent feature and it might find a home on streaming platforms and you, and you want to make another one and it's in the, you know, 500000 to two three million to $3 million range and you can raise the funds and get it made, if it's a solid screenplay and you've got the right materials, you can probably get all that to happen without a manager or an agent. But if you've got a great high concept script and it was on the blacklist and you're trying to get it made by a studio or it's going to cost a lot more money and you're going to need talent attached, then it might be more helpful to have an agent or a manager to help you move it, move it up the chain. So I'll, I'll let Chris follow up. No, I think that that was great, John. I mean, like these, we just need to be clear and, and have a clear line of delineation between what these jobs are both on the sort of industry Hollywood side and on the independent side. So on the independent side, a director is typically the writer of their films. So the question is, do you want to be a director writer of your own material going forward? Is that, is that your goal? And if so, um, you, you can't, you know, no one's going to kill you for getting an agent or a manager in that situation. That makes a lot of sense, especially if you want those films to be, to be uh, sold to, to large distributors and have a theater run, theatrical run, things like that. But it's not necessary. Um, on the industry side, if you're a director, what you're saying to the studio is, send me great movies that you're going to green light to shoot. And so you absolutely need a manager, in a, or not a manager, but an agent. Um, let's talk about the producer side. You, there was a director slash producer thing there, and, and I know exactly what you mean. I think it was who, who put that in there? Um, was it Eugene? I know exact, or, or was that no? That was Bev. I think maybe maybe it was either Bev or Eugene. Either way, thank you both for joining. That slash producer on the independent side makes a lot of sense because a lot of times if you're a director, you also are doing all the stuff. You're doing all the the wrangling of cast and, and contracts and budgets, and you're actually producing this thing as well. Um, but on the industry side, if you're a producer, you're somebody who's been chosen by a studio to develop a project. You've been given $12,500, which is insane, insanely low. It's like the same rate it was in 1971. That's going to change. Seriously, that's going to change soon, which in 1971, that was a good chunk of change because you get $25,000 to develop and then you get your fee. And your fee is between 5 and 20% of the budget. Or sometimes if, if you're a really well-known producer, 
and they're going to use you in the marketing, you're so well known that you can just call your own shot as a as a flat fee. Um, yeah, what's my yeah favorite? exactly. So uh, you, you're 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 tw- you got twelve hundred you got twelve thousand five hundred dollars to try to develop this thing and make it into a movie that's ready to shoot, and that's just a whole different job than uh, than on the independent side in a lot of ways. And no, you don't need an agent in that case because you're working. You're basically like the liaison between the studio's money. You're the custodian for the studio's money and the filmmaker's set. So I hope that I hope that helps <laughs> a little bit. And just understanding the difference yeah, in the jobs. Well, it's important yeah. to understand the distinction between yeah. the two because it is yes. a different game. But I think we're talking primarily to, to independents today. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Somebody want to fire away mm-hmm. the next question? Yeah, I got a, I got another one. I've got a couple of questions in the chat, and I want to uh, throw this one back at you because this was part of the, your presentation earlier. Uh, but the question is, can we revisit finding the right festival? Is it still important the order in which you go to festivals, i.e., Sundance before AFI, et cetera? Well, there's there's two big questions there, and I think the most important one is not to put all your eggs into the Sundance basket. <laughs> Um, I've done a lot of articles about this, and, and it's not just because I did slam dance <laughs> saying this. The truth is, it's less than a half a percent of the people that sub- that submit to Sundance get in. Less than one half percent. So don't put all your eggs into that. It's amazing how many filmmakers make their movie, and they've got their 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 map right, their their strategy, and it always starts with Sundance. Well, guess what? Don't plan on that. There are so many great festivals out there that can help you get strong laurels, credibility in the industry. You meet other filmmakers. I walked out of a pitch once uh, with an investor because I was on a panel at a medium-level festival. Festivals are great opportunities for all the things we're talking about today. Don't put all your eggs into the top tier. So that's the first answer. The second answer is, yes, you can revisit festivals you got to be careful where you have your premiere. You want to mm. be careful that you're not giving it to a tiny festival that's on Film Freeway. It has no business mm. being there. You need to play a festival that has some credibility, which can lead to other festivals. And regional festivals are just as important as the top tier. So hopefully that answers your question. Film Festival Mastery, you can get a lot out of that website. Yeah, and if I added anything to that, I would just say you know the difference between festivals that are Oscar qualifying or awards qualifying or not and know the difference between between a festival that is in a market and a festival that is not a market. Yeah, it's all about doing mm-hmm. your homework. Cool. All right, let's let's run to this on one of the earlier questions it says, do you have any uh, do you have any advice for pitching feature oh, This is right of John's alley. Very specific. Yeah, I think, again, it comes down to kind of what what level and what class we're going for. Obviously, participant media just left the building, and it's a sad a sad time for a lot of documentarians. But the truth is there are a lot of investors out there that are interested in movies that have something to say. SIESociety.org is a great company. They have a fund. You can pitch them. You can apply. There are a ton of grants that you can get for documentaries. But is it is it a bootstrap documentary that you're going to try and do yourself for a few thousand dollars and, you, and you're going to throw a camera on your back or is it a bigger project that's half a million or more where you need bigger funding but there are a lot of organizations I would definitely look at documentary now and docsociety.org great case studies great budgets and great resources you know outside of that I would say you know pitching the why I think Nick mentioned this earlier, the, the four whys, why, why now, why me, why the story, and why you. Know, why you. Pitching those four. Yeah, why, is there a call yeah. to action? And are there partners that are looking to support that in climate, in education, in human justice? Like what category and how do I get partners? Exactly. Let's say I have a uh, autistic daughter, right, and you have a documentary about autism. Suddenly, if you're pitching me, the why me as a producer or a partner or investor or whatever it may be, it now becomes really personal. Like, like I'm in. If this thing is not, not a you know terrible or, or a joke or whatever, like, like, what's it cost? And then you have to talk about where you're going to sell it. 
And that's a really big issue with, with documentaries. Like, have a plan for distribution that makes sense that isn't completely um, uh, vanilla or, or overly broad. And I think that's important. Uh, we, we have um, a friend in the industry um, uh, that runs a, I think it's, what is it called? Oh, I'm having a brain fart, Indie, Indie Flicks. Um, and she has such a smart distribution uh, idea for her documentaries. Yes, yeah, Sheila, and, Sheila and Dream. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know if we wanted to say her name, yeah. but yeah, Sheila and Dream, and 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 she <laughs> and she distributes through <clears throat> education, K through twelve education, and it's been great for her. Yeah, she shifted her whole bottle to social yep. impact. That's what yep. she's doing yep. now. Yeah, well, the other thing that I'll say, and I mentioned this in the in the you know in the presentation, but really really important and there's tons of demos and my email if you don't already have it john at causepictures.com i'm happy to share case studies but you need a really good pitch deck whether you're trying to get funding you're trying to get partners affiliates producing partners you need a good pitch deck and and they're going to ask that question that chris just mentioned which is what is your end game you, are you going to release this into theaters? Are you going straight to streaming platforms? Is there going to be an educational model where you take it into schools? So anyway, we beat that question to death. So let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you gave some you gave some good input, and and just doing a, a time check on this as well. I just wanted to make sure we had adequate time, you know, John, and of course to Chris and myself to make sure we let people know what those other resources are that are available. I think John had already mentioned a couple of them that that you have that you could get out there to the community, um, you know, as they have these additional questions. I know that you're available for consultations. You've done a couple books. I think it would be good for you to, you know, take some time to talk about those. And then some of the questions that we didn't get answered, maybe there's a secondary opportunity for us to, to follow up and answer some of those questions from today. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Nick. I'll, I'll just throw a couple things out for folks. Uh, and I can't see that screen that everybody else sees, but they can – Reach out to us through the, the host and, and our links there. My email is jon at causepictures, C-A-U-S-E-P-I-C-T-U-R-E-S dot com. I'll throw it in the chat. But, um, yes, we have a bunch of great courses, and I love talking to filmmakers and helping them answer these questions and meet you wherever you are. So reach out. Hit that button at causepictures.com. I believe you can book a one-on-one call in the in the in the in the host button up there. But the important thing is to know that it's just a 15 minute free call. Tell me about your project. I'll do what I can to help you, give you some advice. Um, these guys have amazing podcasts and resources as well. I believe your links are there, right guys? Are they in there somewhere? You want to put it in the chat? And Nick, are you, are you going to do that or should I do that or should Sam do that? Yep. So yeah, I've got some, I'll put some more stuff in the, in the chat. I've put some stuff in there earlier for people, but I'll follow up with a couple more links. Um, just so you know, people know that you can reach us on you know Apple, on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify. You can check us out on YouTube, and we've got all sorts of different series. I've mentioned some of them in the chat already. Uh, that we have again providing great insights and information, uh, some laughs along the way uh, with respect to you know what's going on in the film industry uh, at large, and as well with the indie film. Yeah, for sure. Industry. And the name of the podcast is Make It. If you search for the Make It Podcast on YouTube, we'll come right up. If you search for the Make It Podcast, Bonsai Creative, or just Make It Podcast on any of those those other platforms, we'll come right up. And we named it that because it's it's less of a. I mean, I know it's a cute little double entendre, but we also want it to be sort of a calling cry for filmmakers, right? It's like, yeah, this is what I do. I'm making things, and I'm going to make it making things. And we want you to to um, Really keep that in your heart and and go around the world with that message and uh, to to really honor that we made a bunch of little sort of set level gear like like hats and t shirts and things you can wear on set that just say it and then have your city you know or a city you love attached to it and if there's a city you want us to add, let us know we have five more cities coming to the store, but they'll put the link either Nick or intern Sam will put the uh, link to the store in the, in the chat and it's just cool stuff that you can wear around and let let it be known that you're all in and you're a moving train and and this is your your calling cry to to being a creative awesome i just put a couple uh links in the riverside chat if you guys can throw them in the the gather chat um well i'm good for another five minutes if we have one or two more questions the other thing i'll say is 
you know, we can't always get to all the questions before we have to wrap these up. But I know you guys are going to have this cut together and, and eventually uh, present it as a podcast, I believe. I'm going to make sure that we have a version of this that gets sent out as a replay. And anybody that responds to that email with any questions that we didn't get to today, I'm happy to take the time to answer. Yeah, and I so can I can hang for you know, three to five more minutes. I don't know about you, Nick, but I don't know if you can, Nick. Can we just touch on the pitching TV one? Uh, there was a lot of questions about TV in general because we're talking about film. And then is there? And I think Kathy Dorn has a has a question that's interesting too. Um, if you want to read it, Nick. Yeah, well, I think the general question is, yeah, what about pitching a yeah. TV show, right? Any advice? So on pitching a TV, a TV show, show, you need a Bible. You need your story Bible. You need to know how the story ends. You need to generally have the first season or two written uh, already. Uh, if you have a, a pilot, this can be a double-edged sword, right? Like if you make the pilot, first of all, you know, your investors just probably aren't getting their money back. And that's a really bad thing sometimes because – you will have a hard time getting money from them again to go back for your next project. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if the pilot isn't good, then they've already seen what your show is going to look like. And they're like, yeah, I don't want to be involved in that. Um, but on the other hand, if it's really great, that can really take it over the top. And depending on how you want it to look, that's how much money you need to raise to uh, shoot a pilot. Sometimes it's based on where you're shooting. Maybe you want some of the um, tax-based uh, incentives, and so you need to raise the budget to that level to get some of that money back for your investors and for yourself, uh, even if that's more money than you need to actually shoot a single pilot. Um, the other thing uh, is is just knowing how the business works. In, in, um, in TV, the showrunner is everything. And so if you get your show picked up, get ready for the the whirlwind uh, because you have to run the writer's room. You're the producer. You're the rights holder. You're everything. So uh, show running is I have I have space for nothing else in my life but this TV show. And and because of that, uh, networks and streamers have a hard time committing to first time showrunners. And so they may bring in. A showrunner to co-produce with you, and then that's where you need to make sure you have your entertainment lawyer there, because you can also very quietly have your rights sucked right out from under you, um, and then eventually in season two pushed out the showrunner position altogether. So um, a couple of things to think about there. Let me just give you two more quick ones. I know Nick, you got to jump, so we'll we'll cut this off in a second. We'll say our goodbyes, and people can reach out via email, but. Two things that um, hadn't come up yet that I'm glad they did. One is that if you can get a proof of concept made or a, a, a short version of the pilot, you could take these into festivals and they can be acquired and it can either become a feature, become a series. It's a great way to be discovered and kind of test the waters. Some Napoleon Dynamite, Whiplash, Bottle Rock, Bottle Rocket, I mean, some big projects have come out of these proof-of-concept short films. I think Saw was originally a short. So this can happen. Um, Or you can go to a producer's rep who can get your material in front of showrunners if you don't know any. Yeah, and I'll just add the one thing is, uh, you know, how does your story end? Right? How does the season one end? I think that's the question that's always out there, right? It's like, because I think that makes the difference between do you have a TV series to sell or do you have an idea mm-hmm. for a TV series, right? If you just wrote the pilot, there's no show there. Yeah. It's just an episode. Yeah. So let us know how does season one end, and if you're really good, you've got season two. Well, how two, does the show yeah. end, right? You need your, season, you need your series season Bible. Four. Yeah. 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 See, series Bible. Series Bible. Yeah, Bible. There you go. That's the key. Is that it? So selling a TV series is selling a TV series, not an idea for an episode of a TV show. Awesome. All right, guys, we're gonna we're gonna cut this off because we could talk for hours, and I know you are right. back to life. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining joining me on this um, this advance your careers podcast slash webinar slash hybrid. Uh, it's been fun. Again, reach out to us. They have your info right from the chat. They have yep. my info. We'll make sure that you get replays, and we wish you all the luck. This is all about doing your homework perseverance 
and the train is leaving yep. the station. That's right. right. And if we can if we can figure <laughs> it out, Nick, maybe we can answer some of these questions on our podcast um, that didn't get uh, addressed at, on like a special episode or something like that, yep. or, or in a it. segment. Anyway, John, this has been an absolute blast. We would do this again in a heartbeat. This is so much fun. And uh, for everyone listening, this is uh, yeah. we really appreciate your attention um, and um, your time. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, everyone. You guys are awesome. Thanks, Chris and Nick. I can't wait to hear the next episode of your podcast. And thank you all for joining us today. And keep working. That's right. Keep fighting the good fight. Keep fighting. All right, folks. Be good. Take it easy. Bye. (laughs) America, we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. By honoring your sacred vocation of nursing, you impact your family, your friends, and your community. At Grand Canyon University, our online RN to BSN, MSN, or DNP degree programs allow you to balance online coursework with local in-person clinical, practicum, or immersion hours. Find your purpose at GCU. Private, Christian, affordable. Visit gcu.edu.